three, two, one. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're at, in the U.S. and around the world. Thanks for joining us on the show today. We've got a great one for you. Before we start, don't forget, keep uh, sending out all the social media stuff for us because because of our fans out there, we have over 100 countries listening to the show. That's coaches, players, and parents in those countries, and we want to thank you so much. I'm your host, Pete Caliendo, and we are thrilled that you can join us today. Remember, go to Baseball Outside the Box for the podcast audio. Go to ESPN Honolulu also for that audio. And thank you to ESPN. And don't forget, go to Peter Caliendo YouTube and also Facebook. We are live. And folks, we're live on Facebook. If you've got any questions for our guests today, go ahead and just type them in the comments section. Hey, let me tell you something. I am excited about today's show. And I'll tell you why. Because first of all, we're bringing on an Italian-American icon, a legend in the game of baseball. And for that, I've got my uh, Lily, Lily coffee, my espresso shot for Mr. Ron Maestri. Uh, listen, I'm just going to tell you a couple of things about this guy. But this the only if you just listen to this part, folks, eight Hall of Fames in baseball. He's getting the Lefty Gomez Award with the ABC, which is the highest award you can get with the American Baseball Coach Association. He's also in the ABC Hall of Fame. Um, he's been at a College World Series a couple of times. Um, he's, you know, obviously one of the best baseball coaches, best people in the game of baseball. I got to tell you, he's also an ISG um, direct, board of director. And you know all about ISG because we talk about it on the show. And not only was he a baseball, collegiate baseball coach, but he was an AD during that same time. I can't even do one thing. He's doing all kinds of stuff. He's got so much experience in the game. Um, without wasting time, because you're going to see a lot of the show notes, let me welcome our good friend, Ron Maestri. What's up, Ron? Great to be on, Pete. Look forward to it. Hey, I, I could have gone on probably for two hours on everything you've done in the game. Um, and I got to tell you something. It, it is a pleasure having you on the show. And I'll tell you why. Because one, um, I, I get asked all the time, why so many Italian-Americans on the show? It, it, it's by accident. It just happens to be I believe Italian Americans make great coaches, make great um, managers. Why? I think it has to do with some of our history of Italian Americans. Um, you know, what, what do you think about that? I'll, I'll throw that at you right away. Well, we've had a lot of them play baseball. And, uh, you know, um, I'm on the board. You know, I've been doing the Italy. Bill Arce asked me in the 80s if I'd take over the, uh, the Italy portion and bringing all the coaches over there. I mean, we've had Joe Girardi, we've had Larry Rothschild, I mean, you name it, Brian Snitker. We've had some great coaches and uh, Gene Tennis Tanachi, uh, Joe Girardi, oh, yeah. just uh, good people and uh, just spreading the word of baseball and trying to make baseball help the people in Italy get, make their baseball better for their youth. Absolutely. And I'll tell you what, you, you mentioned some of those names. I mean, talk about Lasorda, you know, Socia, you know, we can just go keep Dima, I mean, DiMaggio, whether it be managers or coaches, um, you know, there have been some great ones in the game. And uh, he, here's where I'd love to start the show at, because I think it's important to understand um, you've been in the game so long. I mean, we're talking about over 52 years here. Um, you had this, when you started, when you grew up, from what I was reading, you were in Central Illinois. I want you to talk about where you grew up and some of the impacts that your parents had on what you've accomplished, whether it be in life or in the game, when you grew up as a young young man in Illinois. Well, first of all, Pete, I grew up about 40 miles north of you. I grew up in Highwood, Illinois, Highland Park. Oh, yeah. yeah. I went to Highland Park High School. And I was blessed to have, my dad came from Italy when he was three years old. Um, my dad was a ball player, played a lot of baseball, would have signed, but boy, the Italian mother back then, you got to work. And yeah. my dad had a two pump gas station. I used to tell people, my dad was in the oil business. And <laughs> he, uh, but we had a great recreation program in Highwood, Illinois. They were ahead of the game. In Little League, Pony League, we had, we played, I don't know how many games. My uncle, Bruno Semenzi, how about that Italian name? Yeah. Played AAA baseball. Um, wow. 
had great uh, parental leadership. We played, you remember Thillens Stadium? Absolutely, and Mel Thillens, yes. We used to play there. We play 50 games in the summertime, but it was our parents who were ball players. We learned a game at a young age. We learned the fundamentals at a young age. And thank goodness we had the backing. Uh, we had a leader by the name of Don Skinner, who was the uh, recreational director in this little, it's, it, it was mostly Italians. Highwood's a mile square. Mm -hmm. right on Lake Michigan, right next yep. to Hunt Park, predominantly Italian. Uh, when I'd go to Italy, I'd hear all the names, the Bertuccis, the you name it, all the people <laughs> were from our little town. Most of them were Northern Italy, up by Bologna. My parents came up from Modena, up near Modena. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I've been involved with the game, um, my parents, my, we lived upstairs with my grandparents. They had a garage. They had a one-bedroom apartment. A young coach by the name of Don Davis at Highland Park High School. Um, got to know him when I was young. I knew I wanted to coach. As soon as he moved in, he kind of mentored me. Then he was one of our coaches. Wow. And, you know, I went to Bradley University. Mm -hmm. um, just have had a great background. Uh, been very fortunate to be around a lot of good coaches. Um, just love the game. Um, at UNO, I was there for 32 years. Uh, 30 the first life, two years when I came back when they were going to drop the program. Uh, I had nine years with the AAA club here in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it's, it's been my life. I've, I've been around it and uh, it's something I love. What, what about some of the values? I mean, you talk about your parents, you know, growing up, um, some of the values that they taught you, you know, I know my parents, you know, always said, you know, treat people like you want to be treated. Um, they always talked about respect. I mean, you know, that carries, and also the family value. In those days, you know, we had dinner at a certain time. Um, yep. You know, and, and that's what I asked the question at the beginning, you know, all these great managers in the game of baseball, there's a lot of Italian Americans. And I, and I know there's a lot of other managers that are fantastic too, not just Italian Americans, but it seems like the values that we've, that our parents instilled in us, you know, helped us become better managers, leaders in the game of baseball. Well, you know, we have so many problems today going on in society. Um, and I compare it to, I guess I'm an old timer now. I remember when my dad was saying, you know, hey, well, I'm saying it now. But right. yeah, we grow up, we had respect. We had respect for authority. Um, we, had ex we had, you know, um, a lot of uh, pride. We were taught to have pride in our, um, our culture. Um, mm -hmm. We, we respected law and order. Um, we had the true values of growing up with good parental guidance. And that's something that we lack today and some of the problems. And I like it to my group, to the younger generation today that aren't getting those qualities that we had when we grew up. But we're old timers now, so you know it's that old thing. It's it it doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean it's kind of like the old story. You know, my dad. You know, he used to walk fifty miles to go to work. Well, they don't want to hear that as much. You know, I make tons of mistakes, and I understand when I make mistakes. Um, one thing I remember, my parents. You know, my parents came over also when they were twenty-one. I mean, these were tough times. You know where. They didn't know anybody and they wanted a better life for, for their kids. Um, I remember, you know, values like, I mean, if I even walked across a television that somebody was watching television, if I didn't say, excuse me, you know, my dad or my mom would let me know right away, you know, that, so being polite, treating people well, I think those were all qualities. Um, you know, the, the other part of all this is also, you mentioned the days you were playing when you were a young kid, talk about how 
which when you guys played when you were young kids, were there coaches around all the time? Because it seems like everything's organized now. Um, yeah. Kids can't do it on their own. We'd, we'd leave the house. And of course, back then you could, you could walk, you could go. There was yeah. no, people weren't afraid to get out. We would leave the house at nine, eight, nine o'clock in the morning. We'd go to a playground. We'd be there all day. We knew we had to be back by dinner time, or we'd come home for lunch. We'd go out there. Nobody, there was nothing organized until later on. We, you know, at night we had the parents. We we'd have a team. We'd play. But during the day, our parents are working. We're out on the playground. We're pitching to each other. We're playing. You know, you used to hit the ball and you go out, throw it in from the outfield, put the bat down, try to hit the bat. I mean, it was just today everything's organized. It, it, we say it's organized. And when I go to Italy, that's the biggest question I get from the youth group, the younger. Mm -hmm. We only get one hour a day, one hour a week on the field to practice. And you have to be organized. You, you really have to have a a game plan. You can't just go out there and wing it, uh, throw it to a kid where you get three swings and that's it. So we must have hit, Pete, you're on the playground, you're throwing each other, you're swinging the bat a hundred times a day, mm -hmm. let alone going tonight and then playing the game. These kids don't swing a hundred times the whole summer. Uh. And I don't know. It's just um, we've got the coaches have really benefited in many cases by the travel ball. People are making a lot of money. Uh, they're making a heck of a lot more money than what we did back in those days. And that's all well and good. But I think we've got a way the kids just pay. They pay to play. They don't, you know, they throw a few from the outfield. They play a game. Uh, they don't learn base running. They don't, they don't learn how to bunt. I mean, I learned how to bunt when I was seven, eight years old. Right, uh, right. You learn how to run the bases. Um, you learn how to go get a pop-up. I remember my dad hitting me pop-ups. I mean, just, it was something that when I got into high school, you're so far ahead of the game. I had kids coming into college that didn't have those kind of fundamentals. Wow. They're coming to me in college. Um, so it was a time, I guess it's just a different time. Today, there's a lot of money in travel ball. People are making a lot of money. I'm not anti-travel ball. Um, but I think we're losing a lot of kids to other sports, if we don't make it interesting, we don't make it fun. Um, we got kids going to a lot of other sports. You know what? And that's a great point because I just saw a post on social media by Tom House. And I know everybody knows Tom House that listens to the show. You know, and it was interesting because, you know, my concern also is I'm all in favor of if you've got a travel program and you're running a good program, you're educating you know, you're playing games, but you're also practicing, as you, as you mentioned, we've got to practice more also in the off season during the season. I think they need to practice, you know, not just play games, but the other part of this is we're, we're keeping kids away from the inner cities because some of the inner city kids can't afford it. And there's suburb kids that can't afford it also, not just inner city, but then we're talking about what about the kids who just want to play 20, 30 games a year for fun in-house we're losing those in-house programs, which means we're losing, you know, those kids in the future could play. And Ryan, you know, as good as anybody else, um, nobody knows at 10, 11, 12 years old, if you're going to play college, high school or, or professional baseball. So why cut their dreams short? I'm sure you've had players that you played with that you thought, well, they're just okay players. And next thing you know, they're playing college baseball or big league baseball. Well, let me give you uh, an example. Randy Bush that played for me and Randy had, Two World Series rings with the Twins, and then yeah. just just retired a couple of weeks ago as assistant GM. He's going to be an advisor with the Cubs, but he had been the assistant GM there for the last ten years, fifteen mm -hmm. years. Randy and I, when Randy got done playing, he said, "I want to do something." And we built. Remember Grand Slam USA? Sure, used to work we at had, it. 
we had Grand Slam. We had a we built our building. We had a seventeen thousand square foot building, all the batting cages, automatic, you know, automated. Uh, we had lessons, and we had kids coming in. We've got some good high schools here that play good baseball. But these kids were going into eighth grade. So they're going into junior high. They're going to that school and they're going to have a tryout. And we had kids in there and I'm going, man, Randy, come and see this kid hit. Well, two weeks later, the kid comes in. He says, I didn't make it. Well, you know, what are they, a freshman or an eighth grade? They're what, 13, 14? 13, 14, yeah, sure. And you had kids, I'm going, I couldn't believe some of the kids that got cut. And they just turned off the baseball. That was it. That's a shame. Kids mature physically. You can't tell a kid 10 years old. You see a little pudgy kid. You see him when he's 15 or 16. The difference is dramatic. But, um, yeah, it's happening all over. And I've got my grandkids. Uh, I've got uh, three boys. Um, they're all the same age. The, the twins are 12, they'll be 13. And my other son's boy has just turned 13. Um, they go out, they're on the playground. If you're not very good, they put you in right field. <laughs> you might get that. <laughs> they got their coach pitching the balls over your head and the umpire's calling the strike, you swing at it. All they're worried about is getting the all-star team at the end. And I've had my, my one grandson said, Grandpa, it's not fun. I don't want to play. Well, wow. he's playing the guitar. He's, wow. And the other one, hey, it's not fun. Now, Jake stayed with it for a while, but it's, you know, he gave it up. We have to do a better job. And, and, and when I look at, you talked about inner city, the best thing we've ever done here. I've been involved, Ron Washington called. Mm -hmm. Major League Baseball was bringing the Urban Youth Academy to New Orleans. This is after Katrina. We're the only non-Major League city with an Urban Youth Academy. We have over 2,500 boys and girls participating. Wow. We've got Eddie Davis, who's running the facility, a fantastic guy. Now you talk about fundamentals, those kids go over there. Ron Washington is over there on his hands and knees using his drills with six-year-olds, seven-year-olds. They do a fantastic job. They have travel teams out of that group, mm -hmm. but they're learning the fundamentals. It's the best thing that's ever happened to New Orleans. Um, but that is a model that a lot of people should be following. Absolutely. And he does, you're seeing, we've recruited a couple guys. They're going to different schools. They have a bunch of kids that have been signed out of there. They do an educational component. They, they're really, they're, it's, a good, it's a good program. And we need to incorporate that more than just play a game and that's it. Well, you mentioned key words too, and we and we you know we stress this on the show a lot, and we hear it a lot, but I'm not sure everybody really understands it, and maybe we'll get into it. I mean, you mentioned the key word, you know, most kids are going to say it's not fun anymore, um, and that's the problem, right? I mean, we're not making baseball fun, we're not making the training fun, we're not making a lot of things fun, and that that comes with coaches' education. And folks, by the way, on Facebook, if you have any questions for Coach Maestri, hey, listen, are you kidding? 16 season at University of New Orleans. Uh, athletic director from 90, 1979 to 2000, two college World Series appearances. He's got former players. I remember Augie Schmidt, he mentioned Randy Bush, Paul Maneri, who just retired at LSU. Um, he's got a lot of great coaches coaching all over the country. You know, Ron, you don't know this, but I played against you guys when I was at the University of Illinois Chicago. Um, yep. And and Augie Schmidt hit a home run against us. I'll never forget it. Um, and then later on, I got a chance to meet him. What a great person. I bring these guys up because you made major influence with a lot of young coaches who have then gone on to do some great things. I want to talk about that because I think that, you know, we forget we're not just baseball coaches, right? We're, we're mentoring young people. Talk about 
the influence you've had on a lot of these coaches in, in, in the past? Well, I've been fortunate, and I'll tell you right now, and I've, I've said this, and I'll say it again. The WSLs, they're not that important. What's important that they still call. They call me all the time. Randy Bush calls me once a week. Paul Maneri played for me. Paul calls all the time. Um, it's just you, you have those relationships. They're good people. Brian Snicker, World Series yeah. champion, played for me in 76 and 77. Wow. He with the Braves organization. He didn't get drafted as a senior in 77. I took him to a tryout camp, Bob Didier in Baton Rouge. Bob was with the Braves. He said, I'll give him a chance, Mace. We don't have any money. Brian just wanted to play. He's been with the Braves organization since he signed out of that tryout camp in 1977. Wow, um, amazing. Quaddy that managed the Cubs. Yeah. Right there from Prospect High School, right there in Chicago area. Yeah. Um, great athlete. Um, Mike played here. We just, we've had some good people. They've gone on in Tim Jamison, who was at Missouri for all those years. Um, just quality people that uh, they went into coaching profession. I'm happy for it. Um, we've got other people that have just done a great job. Stuart Weedai had hit the Grand Slam to beat Mississippi State the year we went to the College World Series. Stuart's president of Blossom and Gas. Um, yeah, those are the things, the relationships that you have are more important than the W's and the L's. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I love that. And, you know, the other part of this is you've got to have, you know, baseball is a small world, right? Everybody knows each other, especially now with technology and the ABCA convention, you know, growing more and more. Um, and you've got to have some mentors. I know personally myself, uh, I wouldn't be doing things internationally and what I've done around the world if it wasn't for Dick Birmingham, a good you know, a mentor and a great friend of mine from when I was 15 years old. So I want you to talk about to our, to our audience how you got into coaching? I mean, obviously you said early on you knew you wanted to coach, but how you got into it, who influenced you? And also along the way, who helped you? Because it takes a little help to do certain things. And who are some of those individuals? Well, like I told you, there was a young coach that ran an apartment. My grandpa had, grandma had a, up above their garage. They, my grandfather was a, you know, right from Italy. That's all they spoke was, was Italian. But he made his way here and he was a contractor. He was the building inspector in our town. He built a little apartment. We had a young coach come in, Don Davis. Um, I talked to him all the time. He'd come home after coaching. Um, I got into high school, I played, went to Bradley, played. And at Bradley was the greatest situation I could ever have. I had a ABCA Hall of Fame coach, Leo Scrapiron Schwal. Hmm. Leo played at Notre Dame. I learned more baseball from Leo Schwal. I was a student assistant in basketball, Joe Stoll. Uh, I was hired as an assistant in football and baseball. Uh, wow. Billy Stone was the catcher for Robin Roberts at Springfield Lanford High School. <laughs> Uh, Robin used to be a good friend. I coached him. I beat him in the uh, Sunbelt Conference in 1979 at South Florida. A wonderful man. But it was at Bradley. I, I had, when I graduated, I coached one year at Princeville High School, three years at Spalding, a Catholic high school, great athletes in Peoria. And then my last year at Pekin High School, 1966, they won the state high school basketball championship, Dottie Hawkins. So then I was hired at Bradley to be an assistant, the coach that I played for. I was also the assistant football coach. Uh, then I did a lot of the recruiting in basketball. Wow. The foundation that I received from my baseball coach, the basketball coach, and basketball at Bradley at that time was incredible. I mean, 
I went to Madison Square Garden. I went to, we played Lou Isle Cinder at that time, Pauley Pavilion, played all over. We had Chetta Jet Walker. I had the coaching philosophies of three really great coaches. I was around good people. Um, and then I got the opportunity, and it was funny, I was recruiting in basketball at the Florida State Junior College Tournament in Panama City. And I'm sitting there, and a the guy sitting next to me introduced himself. It was Ron Green. Ron was the athletic director and the basketball coach at the University of New Orleans. He said, we might have a job open in baseball. And they had only had baseball for two years. Would you be interested? Well, what do you say? I said, yeah, I didn't even, honestly, I, I hardly even knew where New Orleans was. Right. <laughs> so I go back to Bradley, I'm coaching there, and I get a call. The job's open. I'd like to have you come down for an interview. Well, I came down. They had an open field. That's it. No fence. They had, a, a, the kids called a lean-to for dugouts. You had four ball poles, a top, and a wooden bench. Um, I didn't, I didn't want to go. I came back. He calls, hey, I want you and your wife to come down. Well, we came down and have been there ever since. Wow. But it was one of those things that um, you met people. And then, of course, when I first got here, I was an assistant of they had freshman basketball. You remember when the NCAA? Yep. I was the freshman basketball coach and the baseball coach. Wow. And I said, man, with the weather and everything, we got to play all fall. I can't be tied up with basketball. Basketball, yeah. And I coached baseball only. And, you know, we built the program from nothing. Um, had the great contacts with Demi Maneri down at Miami Dade, Pat Doherty at Centerville Junior College, and um, I had great, great players. When you look at the Randy Bushes, the Eric Rasmussen's, the Wally Whitehurst, the, all these guys that a lot of them played pro ball, Mike Quaddy, Randy Bush, uh, Brian Snitker, and we just kept improving, and Pete, all of a sudden you get a call. I mean, we had, our field was it was, I had a snow fence. I didn't have a fence. I had to put up, I said, we can't just hit a home run and let the ball roll. So I got a snow <laughs> fence. Well, they don't have snow fence in New Orleans, obviously. I went to a <laughs> You had to bring one in. So we got a snow fence. At least we had, and I would have Wayne Banks. We'd have Duffy Bass. We'd have Gene McCarter at Missouri, Iowa, and Illinois State down we didn't have lights. We started at 10 o'clock in the morning. I didn't have an assistant coach for seven years, my first seven years. The third year I'm there, we go to a regional in Anniston, Alabama. We're Division Two. The next year, 19, that was 73, 74, we're in a regional. We hosted a regional in New Orleans. We get beat a game. We got to beat Nickel State twice. We beat them a doubleheader. Next thing you know, we're in the World Series Division Two in Springfield, Illinois at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, we got beat. We played the cha national championship game against Calvary Ravine. It was unbelievable. But, uh, you know, we built off of that. We got recognition. I had great kids. Um, we had nothing. I mean, I'm fixing the field. I'm you know, the kids are filling in the mound, dragging the thing. <laughs> uh, had to cut the grass. Uh, you, you did everything. I got a call in 1977. We went Division One, And that was the team that Brian Snicker was a senior on. And we had Roger Erickson was our pitcher that pitched in the big leagues with the Twins. I got a call after that from our chancellor, Chancellor Hitt. He said, Mace, we've been watching you and your ball players, and we want to build you a new field. You don't, you never, I can tell you how many times you hear that today. Yeah, exactly. And it was because never. of the players that we had, 
how they conducted themselves. And so he said, now we don't have a lot of money, Mace. We're going to put you in a field on a new campus. Well, it was right down the street. Uh, we had great success then. He said, we got in the next year, he said, we got to get you bleachers. I said, no, we need the lights. We can make <laughs> money if we got lights. Right. We'll get, get some quotes, get some quotes. Well, we got lights. The next wow. year, he calls and he said, we got to have some seats, Mace. We got too many people out there. We got to have some bleachers. Well, we just, you know, then you said, well, I, I was AD my last year. I mean, I'm getting up at six o'clock and I'm at school at eight and doing both. And I had great basketball. I heard Tim Floyd, as you know, Tim was, was the Bulls coach after yep. Jackson who got up you know, I mean, who who could follow that? And they got rid of everybody. But Tim yep. was one of the best basketball coaches. I hired Tim here. We had NCAA appearances, NIT appearances. We had great basketball at UNO. But I was doing both jobs. It just got to be too much. Um, I didn't want to be a part-time coach. Uh, I couldn't stand. I seen guys just come out for the game, show up and coach. No, no. And that's when I said, if I can't come out every day to practice and can't be involved. So that's when I just became AD. And uh, we've had a good program since. Um, Katrina killed us, um, really, really put us, we had 17,000 students. We only got 8,000 right now. Wow. So wow. I've got a good young coach who's doing a good job. And uh, that's basically, I've been very fortunate. I've been around good people. Met Bill RC, you know, Bill way back. Would you come to Italy? Went to Italy. Would you take over this? Meeting you, Tom. What that program was, uh, you know, it's well, just you know, incredible. I got to, I got to ask you this because take us back. You're coaching all these sports. I mean, you're talking about. I'm lucky if I can concentrate on baseball. You got basketball. You've got football. Um, a couple questions I have. One is on the coaching side, how how did that help by coaching other sports? How did it help you in the baseball side of it? Big, you know, I tell people I learned from the best. I learned from a basketball coach. Joe Stoll was like my second father. I learned discipline. I learned the fundamentals, how important it was. He was so positive. I was an assistant I, all in high school. I coached all of them. In fact, I was offered a division, two division one basketball jobs as assistant, one at Drake and one in Northern Michigan. I wow. almost left. <laughs> I said, with the money today, I should have been a basketball. Yeah, no kidding. But no, you learned, you learned the fundamentals of the game. I was at, I'd go to all, just like the ABCA, Football had their convention, NABCA, National Association of Basketball Coaches at the Final Four, they had their convention. I listened to Woody Hayes talk one year at, at the football convention. Remember mm -hmm. they used to dovetail? We'd yeah, back be, to back, yep. They'd come in back to back. Woody's talking about recruiting. He uh. said, the first thing I do is when I go in with a young man, I watch how he treats his mother. He says, if he doesn't treat his mother res with respect, how am I, he's 18 years old, how am I in two hours or three hours a day going to teach him how to be a good kid if he's mm. not already a good kid when he's 18? Interesting. Uh, but I learned the fundamentals. I remember in football, remember the old tackling dummies? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I got an old dummy and on a double play. I'm rolling the dummy at the shortstop in the second baseman. Mm. Just to, then I got a big beach ball. The feeling of a runner coming in, sliding the course back then, you could take out a guy. You can't anymore with NCAA. Right, right. But when I first started, we'd use football is so far ahead of baseball just from the fact of the number of coaches. When I was coaching football, not at Bradley, but you got a, 
quarterback coach, an offensive line coach, right. tennis coach, receivers coach, linebacker coach. We'd go out and each coach, you take the linebackers, you go in with drills. Now, just think if I had, and I patterned after I got it going, where I finally got a pitching coach. I had a student assistant. I made him, he was my outfield coach. I had Tom Schwann and my assistant was the infield coach. We'd break down and you'd go through your fundamentals. Mm. A football player goes out every day with the linebacker coach. He's shedding the block. He's dropping back in a pass zone. Why are they better? We got high school coaches out there by themselves. I was out there for seven years by myself. How do you coach the pitchers and the catchers and the outfielders? If we had the same amount, if I had a hitting coach, a pitching coach, an infield coach, a catching coach, how <laughs> much better would baseball be, Pete? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, Absolutely. you know, the other, the other part of this, let me ask you this. The other part of this is you, you said it early on. It'd be interesting to understand your recruiting because you mentioned, you know, Woody Hayes and um, you mentioned your recruiting process early on. You didn't have much of a baseball field. You didn't. You, the program was just starting. What was that recruiting pitch like to your to the families or to the players? Well, Pete, um, that's why I had. Where was where was uh, Mike Quaddy from Chicago or Kevin mm -hmm. McGann, Peoria, Eric yep. Ray? And Augie Schmidt in Wisconsin. I had all those guys coming down. They want they wanted warm weather. They wanted to play. Uh -huh. New Orleans is a great school. I mean, a great school and a great town. I never had a problem recruiting. We we didn't have the facility like there are today. Mm -hmm. It's very competitive. When you come down south now, you see the facilities. They're, in, they're incredible in the SEC. In sure. our, it's amazing what has happened, which has all been good for college baseball. But when I was there, recruiting wasn't a problem. I had the weather. We sold the weather, the ability to play year round. Mm. New Orleans, uh, we had a great campus right out on Lake Pontchartrain. Um, it wasn't a problem recruiting. Um, we wanted a better, if I'd have had the facility that the facilities had today, there's no talent because we recruited against LSU. We beat LSU 22 out of 30 times wow. uh, the years I was there. We couldn't get a kid, even though we beat everybody. We we're, were the first team in Louisiana that went to World Series. The good kids still wanted to go to LSU, even though they had the facilities and obviously the tradition, the, sure. the, the football. We don't have football in, at the University of New Orleans, but we had a good product. And once we start winning, Pete, and the kids went on, played pro ball, went out into coaching, recruiting wasn't ever a problem for us. But all those things that I learned from football, different drills, how to break down, practice organization, basketball. Pete, I, um, you remember Woody Woodward? And sure. Woody, Woody, a great guy, he scouts for Seattle. He'd come in when I was with the AAA team. And he knows, he knows the game. He's been, he's been a general manager. He coached at Florida State. Um, we were talking about, I said, the question I get in Italy from a lot of the a lady raises her hand. You say, make it fun, coach. How do we make it fun? We only got an hour. Well, I got my grandkids. They're starting to play. I put a T. I put some branches on it, and I got a red wiffle ball. I said, it's an apple. Chop the tree down. Now, they're running up. They're swinging the bat. It was, they were having fun. I took the pitching screen. I got behind it. I said, now try to hit grandpa. They're uh -huh. not picking the ball to throw him. Woody says, we're sitting there watching a game. We're watching a triple-A game where I was COO there at the New Orleans Zephyrs. Yep. He said, Mace, how about the old basketball, the, the, the uh, three-man weave? He said, I used to take my players with a baseball, and we do the three-man weave instead of a basketball. We're teaching eye-hand coordination. 
you get the kids out and you want to sprint. You make it fun. You make it games. You're learning how to proper running here, here, not back and sideways and down the line over here and over here. Come up with the drills. And Woody and I, we talked for so many times and we said, you know, we ought to write a book. We ought to put these together. And I when I went over to Italy, I talked to a lot of these people, but they all wanted the pro coaches. And so much of the people that are at those clinics are the young youth coaches. Mm -hmm. How do you make it fun? Uh, I know you can do it. I know we can do it. Absolutely. But, you know, in our audience, we've talked about this on the show many times. I'm sure our audience get a little tired of me bringing it up, but I keep bringing it up. And I'm going to keep bringing it up. Um, look, I got have a lot of respect for high school, college, professional coaches. Um, but one thing you just mentioned was the volunteer coach. If you take all the volunteers around the world, because majority of coaches in the world are volunteers, they outnumber all the high school, college, and professional coaches put together. And that's why it's the foundation of our sport. And we need to focus more on the things you're talking about, understanding how to have fun with kids. So that way they develop the game faster. And not only that, Ron, but what about keeping them in the game longer? Because we make excuses, in my opinion. We saw oh, in your 13, 14, you find other things to do. But wait a second. If you love playing baseball, you're going to find something else to do. I'm not sure that's always true. Your thoughts? No, you're, you're absolutely right. and. I, when I was with the AAA team, we started, I got, I knew the recreation director in Jefferson Parish, um, just a wonderful man. And I went around to all the, play, I knew all the playgrounds and they're playing games, but they're not getting the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And as you said, most of the coaches are volunteers. They're not the high school coach, they're parents. They're the people that love the game. Mm -hmm. So we put a clinic in it. We did it, I don't know, five years of the nine years I was out there. I took my staff, my AAA staff. I mean, we had Eddie Haynes, who's the hitting coach now with the Pirates. He was with Milwaukee last year. He was yeah. our man. He's in the cage talking on hitting. We took all the playground coaches. We had 150. I took my hitting coach, put him out. I had one of my players. We had him out at shortstop, taking the infielders. We had Ron Swoboda to play with the Mets. He's got yeah. the outfielders. We would coach the coaches because yeah. to me, the most important thing on the playground, these people don't have the knowledge. And I'm not, they're wonderful people. They're volunteering. We wanted to show them just the basics, how to grip the bat, how to get the stance, how to get down on a ground ball, how to throw. We'd take our pitching coach. I had Rick Kranitz, that's a pitching coach of, of, uh, that came to Italy with me and he's with uh, Brian and with the Braves. Cranny was out there. He was a triple wow. A coach doing a clinic. He's got the kids on the mound, the coaches on the mound, the playground coaches. I had a woman come out and say, well, you do baseball, we need to have softball. So I got a softball. I had a lady on fast pitch softball. We had 150 coaches. We need more of that. It's mm. what you do, and it's what in their national sports group, you're going out, you're not dealing with pros, you're dealing with people in their federation that are trying to teach young kids the game. Yep. And that's why what we do when we go over to these countries, you've been everywhere. The, the, the people that you have met the federations where you're setting up a coaching program and you're giving them the fundamentals, we've gotten away with that. We need to teach the people on the playground how to coach the kid, how to have, you know, Pete, I, I tell the Italians, give me three batting tees or you don't have any money, make them. I'll show you how to make a batting tee. There you go. If three volunteers, I can get more swings in 15 minutes from 15 kids, five on a tee with three parents there than they do all summer. Mm. You can wear a kid out in 15 minutes. Go to, you got a plan, 
your practice. If you only have an hour, then we've got to break it down, but you have to make it fun. They can't be just standing out there doing nothing. And that's why what you do, if I go to Italy, you go to Croatia, you go everywhere, Pete, and you're talking to coaches and how to coach the game. Yeah, and you brought up a great point, Ron. The other one was, you know, when you started coaching, you had to do everything. So huh. it's similar to your volunteer coach. You know, your volunteer coach doesn't have four or five people helping them. Sometimes they're there to buy themselves. They've only got so many bats, so many balls. They can set a couple of tees, you know, and they got to figure out how am I going to run a successful practice while well, coming from guys that have done that at all kinds of levels, been by themselves, you can relate to that and teach it much better. Well, that's why I, I've always said, and I, I coached it in high school and I coached it in college. College football, of course, they got all the resources. But Pete, if you took, let's say you just got back from Spain. Mm -hmm. If you took that team over there that you coached that won, if you had a pitching coach, you had an infield coach, you had a hitting coach, oh. you had an outfield coach, and you broke down every day, you don't think those kids would be better? Oh, 100%. We have football players coming right out of college going into professional football. Right. Because they're developed. It's called instruction. Uh, but I'll guarantee you, if I was at the University of New Orleans and I had hitting, pitching, outfield, infield, and a lot of them do now. I mean, it's a lot better and thank goodness it's better. But we got to get the younger kids, the kids to give them the foundation so that when they come to us, mm. they know how to lead off a base. Yeah. They know how to check their outfielders. I mean, I came back for those two years. I was 72 years old. I really wasn't looking to come back to coach <laughs> up the program. And believe me, I knew what I was getting into, but sure. I didn't want him to drop the program. I hired a good young guy, played for pulmonary. Blake Dean won a national championship, was probably one of the best hitters LSU's ever had, if you look at his numbers, his record. Mm -hmm. He came as a volunteer when I came back the first year. Second year, I made him a full-time assistant. And when I left, I pleaded with him to give him the head job. He's there. Wow. He's doing a great job. But the point being, we need the younger people. We need the younger kids to give them the foundation. They enjoy it and they stay with it. You know, you mentioned, you know, about, you, I'm worried about the pro game today. Well, and I'm, and I'm going to ask you about that, but I want before, because I don't want to forget this part either, because you brought up another great point. You went back in the coaching after, you know, stopping for a little while. Tell us what's changed. Have the players changed? Has the system changed? What did you see a difference when you got back in the coaching? Well, it's totally different. And mm -hmm. all I did, I was, not that I was unaware, but I came back and it's all about money it's you got you got eight thousand different things today they want the kids to be in community service which is fine they have social justice which is fine you've got the poor college coach today and i don't say you know the big the big conference the, the sec and them where they have a lot of coaches they got great facilities they got money but the other guys my goodness I just had so much on the plate that it's hard to coach. Wow. Um, kids, I don't think the kids are prepared. Like when I came in in 1971 to the University of New Orleans and when I retired the first time after the 85 season, I had kids coming in. I had to drive them out of the batting cage. Hey, guys, let's go. I got to go right. home. Okay. They came out to practice every day. Today, there's so much on the kids' plate at school. Um, it's just a different time. We didn't have all the things that they had, but I think the kids were hungrier back then than they are today. They were better prepared fundamentally back then than they are now. 
only because what happens in your youth playgrounds? They play, all they do is play games. Mm -hmm. Then they pick an all-star team. The all-star team then goes all over playing, okay? But they play games. They don't get, they don't know how to lead off a base. They don't know how to bunt. They don't teach that. They just play a game. Wow. They don't, you know, and it's, we wonder why now then baseball comes along and we got all the analytics. Why you shouldn't bunt. Why you shouldn't <laughs> steal. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm saying, well, what is the game about then? I don't want to go to and what you pay to go play a game and watch a game in the professional baseball today. They're talking about the games too long. I want to at least get my money's worth. I don't care if it's five hours. Right. <laughs> we, we need to get, and they're concerned about player development. Now they sold all the minor league teams. Now they eliminated. Now Major League Baseball. Now I just saw where Major League Baseball has got these large corporations. The Braves were ahead of the game. They had they owned their Triple A. They owned their Double A. They owned their Old League. They just sold it to this corporation. Now they'll still have the affiliate, but they won't run it. Wow. Uh, it's it's a, it's a different it's a different ball game. It can be a good game. We just need to get the young kids indoctrinated, coached, make it fun, bring them along. Um, you know, some of the schools here, I know in New Orleans, I don't know about up there, but they're having trouble even getting a team to play the sport in some cases. With baseball. Yeah, That's absolutely. I mean, I know in Illinois, um, things have been changing and you got to be real careful because you may not even have high school baseball. Um, it may just be travel baseball. And again, you brought up a good point, you know, and this is a concern of mine. You're seeing a little bit of a change in major league baseball. When you see the playoffs, cause it's such a short, you know, series, you're seeing a little bit more stealing, a little bit more bunny. And only at that time, because they see the importance of it. My concern is because they're not doing it during the season, like you said, a lot of the younger groups aren't doing it. And I'm wondering, wait a second, it's not major league baseball. Why can't you bunt at 13 years old? It's part of the game, you know, bunt for a hit, sacrifice, move guys over, hit and run, whatever, play the game the way it should be played. Worry about later what you're going to do if you make it to the big leagues, because not many guys do make it to the big leagues or professional baseball. I mean, so why not keep those skills going? Well, when you're watching TV and you're watching the world series, of course, during the regular year, for the last two or three years, there's more strikeouts than there's base hits. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So they're telling they want everybody to hit the ball in the air. They're looking about the home runs. Well, now all of a sudden they get into the World Series, you know, seven games. You got your pitch and they're all throwing 98, 100 miles an hour. And the guys <laughs> now you got a bunt. Now you want a guy bunt. He hadn't bunted all year. Now <laughs> right. you want to steal a base, you know. I learned, I learned more. You remember Tim, uh, Tim Foley? Oh, sure. Uh, Montreal. Played, Tim was our manager here in New Orleans when we were with the Nationals. Remember, um, uh, Andy, oh, he was a, could run like heck, played in the big leagues. Oh, I've, no, I'm slipping my mind, but he's playing AAA for us. We're losing, we're losing. New Orleans is losing eight to one. He's on this kid's on first base, can fly. He steals, he's thrown out, and people are going, What is get rid of this coach? He's stealing, he's down eight to one. He's thrown out, and the game's over. And I go down the locker room all the time, and Tim Zer goes, I know, I know, <laughs> you don't steal, but how, what can he do? He can run and he yep. can run. When the general manager calls and says, I need somebody that can steal a base, how do you learn to steal a base if you don't try? So when I get him on base, he's gone every time because he needs to learn how to steal a base. If we're down and we get beat, tough luck. Well, you know, the, the bell goes off. Uh, yeah, this is a guy that's preparing 
his players so when they go to the big leagues, they can utilize what this guy wasn't a home run hitter. He could run. He was a good outfielder. He could bunt. He could steal a base. Yeah. Well, you learn. You, now you get in college or you get in high school. Oh, I can't send him. I can't send him. I got maybe Pete. He can run. That's the only guy I'm going to steal base with. Well, then what are we doing? Uh, yeah. But, you know, I got to, I got to mention this, you know, I started to show baseball outside the box. I took the name because I want, you know, as we're training coaches around the world uh, with ISG, I'm, I'm always telling coaches, look, I know it's important that you learn from other coaches, but it's also important that you become a little creative in your own ways and come up with ideas that maybe can help your team. There's many things you can do. Um, here's what's interesting. And my concern also with what some of the changes that are going on in the game. I love changes. I think you need them, you know, with time and progress and, and all that. But in catching is a great example. One, they, they want to bring in a rule with pitchers where you have to step off before you pick guys off because they want to increase base stealing. They want to have, a, I was in favor of electronic strike zone till I understood that, wait a second, now we don't have to teach framing anymore or receiving because it's not going to matter. That's going to call it. So we're going to take away coaching. We don't have to teach stealing because you're, you're changing it. Now they want to make the bases bigger because that's what I mean. Why they want to make the base bigger because all the analytics, they analyzed all the guys stealing base. He was out by, he was out by a fraction of an inch. So they're saying, if we make the base bigger, he would have been safe. <laughs> so we could add a little. What about game. teaching base stealing better? How to steal? Did Lou Brock? Did Ricky Henderson? Did all those guys? Was the base bigger? No. no. But we taught. I remember my coach. We'd start at home plate. You talk about swing, getting rid of the bat. You talk about your arms going here like a sprinter, not going like this down the line. You're taught to run through the bag. You're right. Not the beer off the bag then you're taught to make the little angle so you come in you go past you touch the bag with your left foot you make a straight line you come around you get your outfielders now you get on first base find the ball check the outfielders how do you get your lead how do you make your break we did this i we did this in 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 the uh, with my mom, with my dad, with my uncle, we did this when we were young. We did it in high school. But read Keith Law's book, what's don't run, don't bunt. So they're not teaching it. Hmm. Now, I, you know, you come out and they talk about player development. The nine years I was with the Zephyrus. All of a sudden, instead of just the manager and a hitting coach and a pitching coach, now they've got a couple other guys. They got the rovers coming in all the time. Guy working with the outfielders, guy working with the infielders, guy working with the pitchers. But just think if you broke it down, and I use football because I coached it in high school. Mm -hmm. And if you had, if I was a GM, I'd have at my lower levels, I'd have a pitch coach, a hitting coach, a base running coach, day after day. They would be better prepared to come up, but they don't have the money? Come on. Right. Ron, is there any changes? And I know we're getting, you, you've been a great host here. I mean, a guest as far as time wise, man, you've been giving us a lot of time. We really appreciate it. Um, is there any changes that, you see in the game that you do like that, that that can maybe you know help progress the game a little bit better when it comes to the development some of the things we might be doing at at college or, or at the professional level well the college is now you know i'd like to see him you know add another coach we're the only sport. you know we got we got 35 kids and you know look at basketball you, you watch, but they, they got, got they got eleven four, players. They got fifteen, fifteen. It's a fourteen on scholarship, and they got eight thousand coaches. Yeah. Um, 
you go out there every day and you have your breakdown drills. You take your guards and you're dribbling, you're passing, you're taking your big guy, getting the ball in the post, making a step, going up. They're better prepared. Um, I'm not talking about the elite conferences. They've got it. They've, they're better off than most. But I'm talking about the mid-majors, the get, look at the junior college, look at NAIA. We got people playing baseball. NAI, Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, junior colleges. Um, but do we have the instruction that's going on as you would with a football? And then they say, well, it's all about money. Well, what are we doing? If we want, if we want to better the game, we need to we need to do what you're doing, going over there. If I go to Italy. I'm trying to bring the guys that can really teach their coaches how to teach their kids. And we need more of that. Uh, we need to get into playgrounds. We need to get, you know, and it's, there's so much politics involved. Mm -hmm. um, I would tell a young coach, if you're in a community, get to know your recreation director, find out what facilities, maybe you, you need a facility. Find out how you can help them. You might be able to even help in the summertime where you'll do a free clinic for their playground coaches. Um, those things, when I had that clinic for the coaches, I got a guy made jambalaya, <laughs> the big pot. We'd get done with that jambalaya and everything. He made it mandatory that all his playground coaches would come out. We had 150 and I had you know, I had Tim Foley. I had, we had great guys out there. Ron Hassey was our manager. We had the pitching coaches. We had the hitting coaches. We had the infield guys. We had the outfield guys. We went through the basics. I had one lady. They, they, some women said, can we come? Absolutely. We're watching, I'm watching uh, Ron Hassey in the batting cage. The lady comes up to me. She said, well, I really like this. You know, my husband works offshore. He's gone two weeks and then he's home two weeks. But my son wants to play catch. He wants to hit. I don't know anything, but I'm learning stuff here. Mm. Well, I'm saying, I'm saying to the lady, if you just show him how to hold a bat, how to get a stance, how to flip him the ball. Oh, I like that. I, I can get some wiffle balls. My point is, you can do it, but it just takes a little time. It takes a little organization. You can't step on people's toes because in every community, there's people that know way more than you or they think right. they do. <laughs> and my point is, I always have thought, God bless, God's been good to me knock on wood. I hope I can keep it going. I said, we got so many retired coaches in our various communities. Mm -hmm. Why not talk to them, have them come out, have them give some information. I mean, I know I, I go anytime I can help. I have friends. You know, I don't charge any money. They said, Mace, how much you want? I, I'll give a lesson to a kid. I'll go out and help somebody if I, but we got a lot of retired guys that are sitting there that I'm sure if you talk to them, they'd come out and give you an hour or two a day. Mm -hmm. um, but it just, I think today in our, in our communities, we have some good programs, but when it comes to baseball, make it fun, not just about winning a championship or taking an all-star team, and going to whatever tournaments there are, but make it fun for the kids. Come out with a three-man drill. Come out with a chop the wood down. Just come up with something and make it fun. Makes sense, Ron. And I'll tell you what, I love that you keep coming back to two things. You always keep coming back to stick with the fundamentals because that's what the game's all about. That's what makes you better. Japanese have proven this for years. They focus on fundamentals, 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 and they're solid at every part of the game. Um, and the other part I love that you keep stressing 
the coaching aspect of it, how important coaches are. And I'll tell you why, because I've always wondered, and I've always talked about this on the show and to other people, I always wondered, you know, we can, we have to send our 10 year olds, if we have a son, you know, a daughter or son, 10 years old to school. And that person that's in that classroom has to have some educational background. I mean, they have to go through, obviously get their college degree and all that. But yet we can send our the same kid to a travel ball program that's just 365 a year and that person doesn't need education. I mean, it's just mind boggling. I'm not saying they don't have it, but a lot of them don't because that's not what they do for a living. And that's why I love that you stress that on the show 100%. You know, it's funny, Pete, when I was at UNO, um, when I was at Bradley, we had a coach, um, not coach, we had to teach. So, you know, the baseball coach had the baseball theory class, the basketball coach had basketball theory, football coach, on and on. Plus, you had to teach, you know, organization uh, facilities. Uh, well, when I got to UNO, we just coached. And, of course, we had physical education. And invariably, the guys got a fundamental of baseball class. Yeah. Well, they would ask us, Mace, would you come in and talk to my class and teach a course? And, but it's funny. You couldn't teach full time because you didn't have a doctor degree. Mm. OK, so the one guy comes to me. Hey, can you give me a good book? Well, Polk, Ron Polk, great guy, good friend, yeah. came out with this book which is one of the best books that he, anybody ever published on how to Still play. is, yep. Still is. So I said, here, well, he, I told, I called Pope, I just, you just made a lot of money. <laughs> they, gotta, <laughs> they gotta buy your book to be in this class. The point I'm getting at, we were okay to go in and teach a course or two, but we couldn't teach it full time. We didn't have a doctor. Now this guy wow. had a doctor, but he didn't know anything about baseball, I and mean, he's teaching the course. You're doing the same thing. How Amazing. do we get these people certified? Mm -hmm. Fundamentals, the basics. Yep. And we're not talking about the analytics is a whole different, it's a whole different thing. But let me give you a thing. If we got time, I want to give yeah, you an example. We got time. I'm the assistant football coach. I have to go scout. We're going to play Wisconsin Green Bay. They sent me to Wisconsin Green Bay, and it's in November. And I said, do you have a press box? And they <laughs> said, oh, yeah, we have a press box. I said, well, i like a scouting pass. I'm coming yeah. up. Well, I get up there. There were two guys in a press box. I had a wooden bench. It's like zero, and it's snowing. <laughs> now, Pete, here's the analytics. Now, listen, we had a four by eight card. On that four by eight card, you had the center, the two guards, the tackles. When I'm scouting, I'm watching the first play that they ran. I put the quarterback either under or back. Did they have the split end? Did they have a tight end? Did they have a slot? I'm looking and I'd have to put that in. On the card, you had first down, second down, third down, right hash mark, left hash mark, okay? So let's say the first play was a handoff to the fullback off the right guard. I put that down, I put first down, I check that, check right hash mark. Now, I did this for every player. Wow. When I got back to Peoria, I would spend the whole day with a punch. I'd punch <laughs> first down, right hash mark, okay, and the play. When I got done, I had a knitting needle, a long knitting needle. If Please. I want to know what they ran on first down on the right hash mark, I put the needle needle through and whatever was on that needle was the first down play. Now that's analytics. When I was at UNO, I made a card up. I had the diamond. I'd watch batting practice. 
I'd watch the other. I knew the guys that had the close stance. The only way they're going to hit a ball is going to hit it the right center field. Mm. I'm playing you. I see Pete pulls everything. Okay. So the first time up, the kid comes up. He dribbles the ball to the second base. And the second time up, he hits a fly ball to center field. Third time up, he hits one down the right field line. Where does he hit the ball? He hits the ball to the right side. Did he steal a base? What kind of a lead does he have? Mm -hmm. We had those. Right. We're making now, we're, we're, we're making it, we got the shifts. We shift. You played the game. I, I was an infielder. I remember Leo going, get over in the hole. Right. Holds the ball. You're at second base. Get over there. You don't need to be over. Get over there. I, I, don't, I, I guess I'm not opposed to it, but don't get away from the basics. You still have to run. You still have to catch. You still have to throw it, and you still have to hit it. Don't you know, make it one of my mentor, and I want to ask you about this, and we're getting close uh, to the end here, folks, but uh, I could keep running for five hours, man. Um, my mentor always said, Dick Birmingham, one of the most successful high school coaches in the country, he's always said this thing to me. He said, it's nice that you know your opponent, but you only have so much time. Remember, you need to concentrate on making your team the best they can be. And he stressed the fundamentals. I mean, the importance of that. No question. You know, I learned, uh, I learned, you know, we were always taught, Pete, you get a base hit, you make the little turn at first base and you tag the base with your left foot. Well, I remember in high school, I'm, I'm all over. I got a kid, he's running down. You got to tag it with your left foot. Right. <laughs> Some of the kids then, just coordination. Tell them to yeah. tag whatever foot they can. Yes. You got the little stocky guy that can hit, but he can't run, but he's running around. He's trying to tag the base with his left foot. He can't do it right now. Well, let, it, let, let him go. Let him touch with his right foot. Who cares? Okay. Mm. But know your personnel. Know what to Paul Maneri always kids me. He said, Mace, you hindered my career. <laughs> you made me. I batted night. I led the nation and sacrificed buns. I said, you <laughs> because you knew you were one of the few guys on our team that could bunt. Yeah. We had we had a great team in 78, 79, those teams he played on. He was so valuable. He could hit and run. He could bunt because his dad was a coach. He was around it. He learned. He could run the bases. He just, those things are taught at an early age. And we don't do it anymore. You know, and speaking about early age, I, I, I talk about this at times. You know, I, I grew up at Mickey Owen Baseball School for 10 years when I started at 15 years old. I always say this, and it's true. Talk about talent. I had very little of it. Couldn't run, couldn't, couldn't, uh, didn't have much bat speed, didn't have arm speed. I didn't have anything really. I was just a below average player. But because I could do other things that you're talking about, I was able to go to college and play college baseball. They should have never played college baseball, but if, because what they taught me, Mickey Owen, the fundamental skills, the game itself, understanding the game that helped me tremendously. I would have never played college baseball without it. We had, we had a kid, my dad, I knew through high school from Waukegan, Illinois, Brian Traxler, one of the best hitters we've ever had at the university of New Orleans was with the Dodgers and got up with him. Um, the little squatty, Everybody like, oh, look at him, little gut. He could rake. He could hit. We were always worried about the bodies. Oh, I don't. And now I see guys up there. John Crook wasn't a body, was he? We've mm -hmm. got guys, if you can hit, you can hit. Now, yeah. you've, you, you've got to do other. Where do you play? Can you? But the basics, the basics, the basics. I, I relate it to the golf. I mean, I don't play that much anymore, but hey, you go to a golf pro, he's going to break it down. You're going to start with the grip, just like in baseball. Yeah. You're going to start with the stance. 
you're going to start where you get here, where you set the club, just like you're coming down here. You got to set it inside, just like you're hitting. But the instruction, if you're going to be a good golfer, you've got to go to a golf pro and you've got to learn the basic fundamentals. I've always maintained, Pete, if you get a kid and he's got the bat wrapped way around his head all through Little League, all through high school, now he's coming to college. I told my coaches, when you go out, it's hard to break a habit of an 18-year-old kid that's been doing something this way. Absolutely. For 18, well, not 18 years, but since he's been playing since he's six years old. Yep. It's hard to break a habit. It is. Randy and I at the Grand Slam, we just told him, be nice and short to the ball. Make it easy. Basic fundamentals. We don't have to get into this and this. Get the stance, not the closed stance, the bat wrapped around your head. You can help somebody 100%. And I take my grandkids, they wanted to, they, they, they said, I want to play golf. Okay, let's go take some lessons. I want to learn right now the right way, right way to hold the club, right way to get your stance, right way to take it back. Not that you're going to be a golf pro or make the golf team, but if you want to learn, and if I really was serious and I wanted to play more, I'd go to the pro, I'd get the lessons to do it the, the fundamentally right way. We're losing that today. Yeah, I think that's a great message to continue to give out. Um, Ron, let's finish it with this. Anybody that's getting into coaching nowadays, um, maybe some advice, you know, on, uh, you know, how to get into coaching, you know, what they should be focusing on. Because a lot of times we, we tend to focus on the ultimate goal and we forget about what we're supposed to be doing. Pete, I told, and I, when I went to the Zephyrs, the pro club, you know, we ran Obviously, we were with the different organizations. They send the players, the managers, and that, and we run the operation for profit. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of young kids, interns, and, and I felt like being a mentor was important, okay? But if I were a young kid and I get this all the time, hey, I want to get into coaching. If you want to get into coaching, you better join the ABCA. You better mm -hmm. go like this year, it's in Chicago. Yep. You better be in every session. And that's, I went to listen to Woody Hayes. I went to listen to the basketball coaches. My God, uh, Chucker at, that won it at Cincinnati. Those, I'm an old timer. That goes way back. I'd go to those conventions. I'd listen to people talk. I had the opportunity to be around good people. You learn. But if I'm telling a young kid he wants to be a baseball coach, first of all, go to the ABCA convention. That's number one. In 1966 was my first ABCA. I had taken a job at Pekin High School. I had just got married. I told my wife it was in Houston. I got to go. She said, honey, we don't have any money. She's getting her degree. I'm making $12,000 a year. Okay. Oh. I said, I got to go. Now, the school didn't pay. I paid my own way. It's the best thing I've ever done. Mm. How do you learn? You've got to be around good people. If somebody wants to come and call me here, I'll sit down with them. And I have, I have kids now. How do I get into They wanted to get in minor league baseball, as you know. They mm. want it. They think it's, uh, you know, it's watching the game. You might be. You might be in game management. You might not ever see the game. You're lining up right. the, the mascot and everything else. But there are things. There are places that you can go. I used to go to that seminar. They used to have that major minor league seminar. Mm -hmm. um, the At guy, the winter meetings. It used to be in San Antonio. The chicken had come in. Captain yep. Dynamo blew himself up in second base. They had the best concession stand. They had the best TV, how to get a TV market, how to get a radio market. I said, guys, if you want to go, go to that and you can get some information. Go to as many of these coaching clinics as you can. Meet people, talk to people, let them know you're interested. 
all of a sudden, I mean, I got people calling me all the time. Hey, can you help me get a job here? Well, what's your experience? Go to work, get a mentor, volunteer. And I'll tell you, it's, uh, there's no secrets. It's, you got to work. Too many kids today want to come out of college. I want to coach. Okay, well, there's, a, I can get you this high school. I don't want to coach in high school. I want to coach in college. Yeah, really? pro ball. Okay. Yeah. The best thing when I was an athletic director, when I was hiring, I wanted, when I hired a basketball coach, I wanted to know when that official threw it up to start the game, that my guy might not have all of the talent, but he knew how to coach. Ah. He was to be competitive. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like being, I was a high school coach. I was a college coach. I worked all around professional baseball. You learn the best experiences I have. And I probably screwed up so many kids when I was first coming out and you're in high school and you're trying the different methods and everything yeah. else. You can't, you can't buy that experience. So mm -hmm. when I hired a coach at UNO, I wanted to see what was his background. I liked it when a guy had a, he knew he had a baseball coach. He knew how to take care of his field. He worked for so-and-so. He was an assistant. In the summertime, he went to one of the leagues. He volunteered. Um, yeah, that's, you, you can do it. And find a mentor, find somebody that really wants to help you. Uh, but it's like we all did. It's a lot of work. But if you love the game, Pete, there's more opportunities today than there's ever been. Absolutely. So many more opportunities today. Absolutely. But you have to, you might have to start down here. And we all did. And yeah. And I look, I love that you brought that up because I was going to ask you as an AD or as a head baseball coach, one of my last questions was going to be, you know, what do you look for in coaches if you're going to hire somebody? Boy, and you answered that perfectly. Couldn't answer it better. Well, it's, it's, it's the way it is. And, uh, I, you know, today we have so many, we have guys and, and I, this is a big name guy and I'm not going to mention because he was a good guy and a great coach. And I had an opening. He called, he said, coach, I got a guy for it. He's played in the NBA and he's my volunteer right now. I said, okay. I knew the guy had a great, he was a great college player. I said, has he coached yet? Well, he, you know, he's my, he's my volunteer. Has he ordered his equipment? Has he scheduled? Has he has he on floor? He can on floor coach at that time. Mm -hmm. So just because he played in the NBA, you know, like somebody said, you hired Tim Floyd. Tim Floyd was an assistant for Don Haskins at Texas El Paso. You know who Don Haskins was. He was his main assistant for seven years. Wow. Then he was at Idaho. And when I hired him, you know, everybody goes, Tim Floyd? Well, he went to Iowa State. He won there. He went to the Bulls. You know, he got a bad rap there. He was at Southern Cal. He came here. He was our head coach. He was 500 with our pro team. And they fired him. <laughs> and he went to the playoffs. <laughs> and they wow. haven't been since. But the point being, you're looking for somebody that has experience. I don't care if it's high school, college, whatever. And, you know, he's got the basics. Awesome. Great way to end it, Ron. This is fantastic. I uh, cannot thank you enough. Um, this might be the longest show in the history of baseball outside the box, which, which is a credit to you. Um, I can't thank you enough, man. Thank you, Pete. Have a Merry Christmas, and I'll see you after the New Year. Well, I got to tell you, because this way I was going to end it, is uh, we are going to see you at the ABCA getting the Lefty Gomez Award. Um, hopefully you're having one of those uh, cocktail parties, you know, with the free drinks.
because I'll be there if it's free. Um, no, we're just looking forward to seeing you get a, a, an awesome award at the ABC. It's the highlight, even a, after the being in a Hall of Fame there, it's got to be one of the greatest highlights in your career. Uh, I'm very honored. And it's because of a lot of people like yourself and Bill Arce and all the people, all the experience I have, it's not about Ron Maestri. It's about the people that gave me the opportunity, about the people that, the players, the parents, the coaches, the assistant coaches. Um, that's what it's about. And it's uh, the Lefty Gomez Award should be a, an all, not, not about an individual. And, and I really mean that. I'm, I've been very blessed. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to being there and it's going to be a special evening. Folks, abca.org, go to it. Uh, you know, it's better with 7,000 coaches at the convention every year. It's going to be a great event here in Chicago. Um, Ron, again, thank you very much and uh, Merry Christmas to you and your family and Happy New Year. We'll see you at the ABCA. Thank you, Pete. I really enjoyed it. All right, folks, that was awesome. Ron Maestri, the Lefty Gomez Award, ABCA. I want to thank him. Special thanks to producer Brian Crock with the Line of Media Group. And also special thank you to everybody in the U.S. and around the world for joining us. Don't forget, go to BaseballOutsideTheBox.com, the audio, YouTube, Peter Caliendo, Facebook, Peter Caliendo, and ESPN, Honolulu. Thank you, everybody. And don't forget, stay safe, be healthy. God bless you. We'll see you on the next show.